This is Professor Matthew Schmidt, and welcome back to Genetics. We're going to continue in this session with our exploration of the eukaryotic chromosome. We're going to pay special attention to two structures, the telomere and the centromere, and these are structures that you've probably heard about before, but we want to go a little bit more in depth with respect to both their structure and their function. So first, let's define these terms. The centromere is a DNA sequence that serves as an attachment point for what are usually called the spindle fibers, but they're really microtubules that grab on to and separate chromosomes during mitosis and meiosis. The telomeres, on the other hand, telo means end. Think of telophase and mitosis. It's the last phase. So telomeres are DNA sequences as well but they're located at the very ends, the tips of eukaryotic chromosomes. Now, remember that all eukaryotic chromosomes are linear, and as we're going to see, this is an important reason why telomeres have to exist. Both these structures are completely unique to eukaryotes. They're not present in bacteria, and they play vital roles in cell division processes. Let's face it, bacteria have one chromosome, so there's not going to be a lot of highly orchestrated movement of chromosomes going on. And uh, since their chromosomes are circular, we'll see why in a minute, but they don't have any need for telomeres. Now, let's look at the centromeres first. Centromere DNA sequences are highly conserved. We've said that a lot lately. It just means that the sequences don't differ very much from one species to another. And this implies they're also constrained, meaning that they play a similar role evolutionarily in many, many organisms. So there's most, I wanted to say most definitely, but pretty clearly, a similar mechanism of action in all eukaryotes. Yeast chromosomes have been some of the most widely studied, and we know the most about them. So the centromeres of yeast chromosomes are short sequences of just about 120 bases. And they've also been demonstrated to be interchangeable between chromosomes. That's pretty wild. So in other words, in yeast, if you take the centromere from chromosome one and sort of do some microgenetic surgery and just replace that and put it on chromosome two, everything still works just fine, all right? Now with respect to human uh, centromeres, uh, human chromosomes contain a tandemly repeated, just means one after another, of about 170 bases repeated a lot, anywhere from 5,000 to 15,000 times. So uh, the centromere is a larger structure in humans, but the basic idea is similar. You just have a lot of repeats there. Just for the record, there is some confusion about this term, kinetochore versus centromere. So, because sometimes during cell division, people will use the term kinetochore, then they'll say centromere, meaning the same thing. They're similar, but they're not exactly the same. The centromere is specifically the DNA sequence that we just described, but the kinetochore, kinetochore, kinetic means movement, right, is a complex of proteins that associates with the centromere during cell division, and the spindle fibers actually directly attached to the kinetic core. So it's like spindle fiber, kinetic core, that kinetic core, sorry, is glued on, stuck on to the centromere. So for, for a lot of purposes, it doesn't matter that much if you use one term or the other, but one's protein and one is DNA. Telomeres, on the other hand, exist at the ends, as we've said, of eukaryotic linear chromosomes. They are linear, but you'll see that this linear part really is important to understanding the function. So human telomeres contain a sequence. I don't know if you'd be asked to memorize this or not, but it's TTA, GGG. And it's repeated anywhere from 500 to 3,000 times at each end of the chromosome. The sequence, check this out, it's identical, not just similar, in all vertebrates, and among other eukaryotes, it's highly conserved. So it's the same idea. The mechanism of action is likely to be similar in pretty much all eukaryotes. But why do telomeres have to exist? 
They exist because of what has been called the end replication problem, and this exists for all linear chromosomes. So due to the mechanism of DNA replication, we've discussed this if you've been watching along, it involves RNA primers, right? So there's an RNA primer, the DNA is extended off of that, and then the RNA is destroyed, and DNA fills it in. But DNA polymerase cannot just start. It needs the primer, right? So the bottom line is the ends of the linear chromosomes, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, cannot be replicated, which causes the chromosome to get shorter after each replication cycle. That's not great. If it gets short enough, there could be a lot of problems with that, right? So you can think of the telomere as sort of like a buffer zone. Given that you're going to lose material in the replication process, it's okay for that part to shrink because it's not informational. And we're going to see every now and then it may be replenished as well. But first, let's understand the end replication problem. So here we have some double-stranded DNA. Think of that as a whole chromosome. Um, and we want to replicate that, right? So remember, um, what's going to have to happen is these are the two original strands. They were separated. And there are a lot of RNA primers that were in there. But at the very end, you're going to need this RNA primer to extend in this direction, right? And over here, you're going to need this RNA primer to extend in that direction. When that RNA primer gets removed, you see over here, the problem is there's nothing over here that DNA polymerase can start to fill in that gap. So you get this missing DNA, which literally is missing. That piece of the chromosome has become shortened. And if you picture this going through multiple replication cycles, there's going to be a problem of getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So what can we do about that? It doesn't seem good. It's not good. So telomeres terminate, well, you see here, with three prime overhangs. So this right here is a three prime overhang because there's the missing DNA over there. So the telomere has this three prime overhang uh, as cell division occurs. Now, the enzyme that can fix this or can replenish telomeres is called telomerase, as you might expect. It's an interesting enzyme. The protein is the catalytic part, but it is a protein RNA complex, and it's able to lengthen the three prime overhangs in a very interesting way that allows um, the telomere to be replenished. And interestingly, it is a reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase was discovered in retroviruses. This is not the exact same type, but what the reverse transcriptase does is that it takes RNA as a template and makes DNA from that. So it makes the DNA that's going to be necessary to fill in the chromosome from an RNA template that the enzyme carries along with it. It's a very definite and tight complex. So telomerase uses the template RNA to add several copies of the telomere sequence onto the three prime overhang. Then the cell can use a conventional DNA polymerase to return the five prime ends to their previous length. Another RNA primer is required for this step. So here's this three prime overhang over here that we know has to, well, well let's see if we understand. What used to be here was the RNA primer that was necessary to extend that piece of DNA, right? Now the RNA primer got removed. There's that so-called missing DNA there and our three prime overhang. So enter the fancy telomerase enzyme. You see it here in green is the protein part. In red is the RNA portion. So it recognizes and binds to the three prime overhang due to complementarity. Check this out. So remember we said this is just repeating G, uh, TTA, TTA, GGG, right? Over and over and over again. The RNA is therefore AAUCCC. It's complementary. So it starts to bind onto here. And then it's in position now so that it's going to be able to use its reverse transcriptase uh, capability.